Anything else? Categories on your sales page or your best sellers list. You're not browsing. Okay. Who'd you pick that up from? Alex Niehaus? Yeah, Alex is a good dude. Any last things? Sorry for people just joining us live. The 3.5 million people, according to my calculations online, thank you for being here. Um, I'm, I asked if there's anything that we picked up from the conference so far. The many uses of AI. You're in the right place. We're going to talk about that. Anything else? Anything cool? Did anybody go to karaoke last night? How are you here? <laughs> I had a friend who woke up next to a pizza on his bed and uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't know how it got there, didn't know how he got there. I won't out them, but I will stare at them. <laughs> oh, anyway, OK, we're going to jump in. So we're talking about this. We're leveraging assets. Not those assets, guys. We're talking about books. That joke is why I can't change the name of this uh, talk. I love this talk because I used to hate this talk. This was a talk that I, I put together because I needed something. It was just like a last minute, oh my gosh, I gotta fill a spot for somebody else. Let me just throw this together. And isn't that how it works? Like our book that we're like, oh my heart and soul, everything is in this one, this is gonna be the one, and then like one person reads it and gives us two stars. you know. And then it's the other one, we're like, well I just need to have something out before Christmas, and it blows up. This talk, seems to resonate really well. I know I'm kind of setting the bar high here, so if you hate it, just leave, don't tell me, I don't want to know. Um, I think it's really helpful. I, I like this talk because it, it turns out there's some stuff that I thought was maybe more intuitive or maybe more obvious that it seems like isn't, and maybe I approached this a different way and that's why I didn't realize it, but I want to give this to you because it is such a powerful tool, uh, leveraging your, your books as assets, it's such a powerful tool in our writing career and if we uh, don't do it, we end up in the grind of having to just pop out another book and another book, and we gotta go faster and more and more, and then we burn ourselves out. Ask me how I know. Uh, real, by way of introduction, so my name is Nick. I have leveraged asset, that's a dumb slide. I've done this stuff, okay? I built Author Email, uh, which is an email service provider for authors. I sold that to draft to digital in 2020, because I had nothing else to do in COVID. And uh, now I'm the vice president at draft to digital among other things. I'm a full-time author, of course. I've written about 40 thrillers. Um, I've built book career in a year. So all of this nonfiction content, coaching, teaching, training, all that stuff, I, I formalize, or am formalizing, and putting it onto a website called Book Career in a Year. And the idea is, I'll teach you how to build a book career in one year. Um, the last thing, I just put up this kind of fun, I, I built a radio station, an internet radio station for writers. It's like podcasts and then like, music with no words for the rest of the day, so you can kind of write to it. I just thought that was kind of fun. I'm going to apologize in advance for anybody who has my eyesight. You're not going to be able to see some of the words up here, because I went design mode and not helpful mode when I built these slides. Um, but all the slides we'll make available. If we can't figure it out, email me. I'll get them to you. Uh, no worries. I'll try, though, to talk through everything that's on them so you'll know. This is about you and your books, not me. So uh, we're going to talk about this problem of getting up the mountain. Do you know, uh, raise your hand, what the mountain is when I say that? Familiar with that phrase? I mean, I know you know what a mountain is, but uh, Neil Gaiman, I believe, gave this commencement speech years ago, and he talked about this idea of moving up the mountain. And obviously, first, you have to identify what the mountain is. And for us, usually, it involves writing a bunch of books and being famous or being well-liked or whatever it is, but books are involved. And so the problem is, there's a million, bajillion ways up the mountain. And we often, as, as writers, we come to things like this, and we're like, I gotta figure out that way up the mountain. So we go talk to Alex and say, hey, well, what, what do we do for my category, for my keywords? And then we do that, and then tomorrow, we come down and our, we're still not selling our books very well. Uh, and then we go to another talk, and it's on Facebook ads, and we change the categories there, do this here, and then we go to sleep, and we wake up, and we're still not selling well. And so we try all these different things, or we hear these different things, and none of them are wrong, but there's too much of it. That's the problem, right? There's too much to do. There's not, not enough time to do it. You know that you should write another book. You know, 20 books itself was founded on this idea of write another book, write another book, write another book, and then retire in Cabo, right? You know you should be marketing, doing advertising, newsletter swaps, playing around on TikTok, that kind of stuff. Um, but you also know that you're not where you want to be, and you've tried almost everything under the sun. So I'm trying to 
help you get up the mountain. Um, we kind of talked about this, but yeah, the ways up the mountain that we all kind of know right now are write more books. Um, one of the ones that I'm constantly struggling with is writing better books. I can write fast. I've dictated a book in a day. I did, gave a talk about that yesterday. 80,000 words and one car crash later, I had a whole book. <laughs> That's not a lie. But we're not here to talk about that. That's a good story. Um, better books, right? So craft is something I've always thought, well, maybe if I write better, my books will sell better. And that may not necessarily be wrong, but how do we do that, right? The last one, this is the common one, and a lot of times why we're here, is different marketing. We think, well, my way up the mountain is to market better. I gotta figure out Facebook ads, I gotta figure out TikTok or book talk, book book and book space or whatever, you know, whatever the thing is, we gotta figure it out. And there's always a new one, right? That's the quote, by the way. I knew that as long as I kept walking towards the mountain, I would be all right. The solution, I believe, is to make sure that you're leveraging your assets as much as possible, as best as possible. And so I want to give you some ways that I've found to do this in my own writing career, things that I've actually experimented with. Um, I will give you examples of them, but before we do that, I'm going to give you kind of the overview. So here's the buckets or the categories of how I leverage a, a single book asset. Um, and then I'll give you, I'll show you what they look like and give you examples, then we'll ask questions and we'll go eat lunch. Sound good? All right, first, what is leverage? What am I talking about? Don't you like the design? It's annoying because I have to keep clicking to get to the meat. I put up these one-sentence slides. It's not very helpful. Um, leverage is freedom and power, okay? And what I mean is there's these examples I've come up with. I'm sure there's more, but leverage is a force multiplier. You create one asset, and you want that asset to provide a net positive to your career, to your bottom line. Leverage is a way to do that. You can multiply that asset across a lot of different entities. Um, it's power, like I said. Leverage provides power to you, who owns the asset. It's freedom. This is a big word for us as authors. Um, we're doing this because we don't want to have a day job, right? We, we, we want to write books for a living. Legacy, this is one I talked about a little bit yesterday and I, I love talking about because you're not gonna be here forever as I discovered in that car crash. Leverage allows you to benefit long after you're gone from doing that work you already did. Okay, it's really powerful. Of course, it is a time saver as well. That's certainly something to talk about. Um, you're only one person, you can only do so much. Guys, we burn out very easily when we're not aware of what's happening. So leverage is a great way to save ourselves. Similarly, it's an energy reservoir. It's actually something that I believe can save your life because I believe it saved mine. Using leverage rather than trying to just push out more books all the time. Again, I'm not saying that that's a bad strategy. If you can do that, more power to you. But it damn near killed me. So I, you know, preferred something different. <clears throat> so how do we do this with books? This is where we're going to get into over strategy, overall strategy, and um, then we'll get into some examples. But the main question that I want you to ask when you approach a book or an asset is how can I make this thing that I've made available to as many people as possible all the time, wherever they are? Very simple, right? Here's how I look at it. There's a process, there's a, there's a, a, a phase or a, um, a, a system, I guess, what I'm trying to say, chronological order that I go through when I, when I produce a book. Obviously, this starts with writing and publishing the book. And I do ebook first. I'm gonna give you this uh, from my perspective, okay? I'm not saying that you have to do it this way, but just so we can talk about leverage and how to do it, I'm gonna tell you what I do. So I start with the ebook. I'll write a book. It's always gonna be an ebook format first. It's gonna come out as an ebook first. A lot of times I'll go direct to Amazon or exclusive to Amazon. Uh, lately I've been pulling down some of the series that don't sell as well and I'm gonna go wide, but I, I have series that do really well in KU, so I'm gonna stay there. So this isn't a talk about you should always go wide or you should always go KU. Dude, does that make sense when I say KU? Anybody not aware? Okay, I can explain stuff. Just yell at it, yell at me and I'll stop. Um, the second thing I'll do after the ebook is out for a while, two to three weeks or months, depending on how lazy I am, the print book will come out. Paperback is next. I don't really do hardcover unless there's a special reason for it. Um, but Paperback comes out, that goes to Amazon, draft to digital. I actually upload it to uh, Ingram because I have ISBNs because I'm an idiot and bought a block of those. Um, so I will just basically make those 
uh, those paperback versions available wherever I can. Because again, there's no exclusivity with paperback, right? After that, depending on how lazy I am, six months to six years later, the audiobook version will come out. Um, I try to do it sooner, but it, it usually is a while. Audio takes a little bit longer, but I try to get the audiobook out because every single time I release something like this, another format, this is a promotional opportunity, right? So I can release the ebook, and if I just say, hey, this book is available, and then it's available in all three formats, my readership might choose one or the other, and I want them to get all three of them. So I'm going to release the ebook to them first, and then two months later, uh, they're also really old and they forget everything, so they didn't know they read it already. So I use that to my advantage by, uh, by saying, hey, this book is out in paperback form. And they're like, I've never seen that before. And then they buy it as well. And then six months later, the audiobook will come out, and they'll be like, I've never heard of that book before, and they'll buy it again. <laughs> Unagi. Le after that, um, here's where we get into some of this leverage stuff. So most of that that we just talked about is pretty obvious. You guys have probably heard that. Oh, I should release an ebook and then a paperback and an audiobook. There's plenty of talks on how to do just that, right? This is where we get a little bit more fun. The fourth thing that I'll do with every book, specifically the ones that are selling really well and that I think can, can, can I want to leverage first, basically, um, I ask myself, can I split up these chapters and rework them in some way that allows um, me to re-release them in like a slightly different format or version? I will give you examples, so don't worry. We're going to talk about that. Then the fifth thing, can I do the same thing with the audiobook version that we made? Can I split that up into chapters and release that in some cool, fancy new way? And then lastly, these special editions that we've heard of, hardcover versions, I call that special edition because it's not something I usually would do. Uh, signed copies, illustrated copies, comic book versions, all that kind of stuff I would throw into that last category called special editions. Now, you're probably already getting, your mind is going, right? You're, you're thinking, well, I didn't, okay, there's some stuff I can do here. And yeah, it's more work, but it's usually less work than writing a whole other book. And that's the point. That's, that's why this is leverage, because you've already written this content. You've already created this once. The idea is to take that and expand it into any number of opportunities that you may not have thought of before, you may not have tried before. <clears throat> so for the first one, uh, Talk about ebook formats. I mean, these are these are all obvious, but start thinking in terms of you know we've got this ebook, and I'm going to use the example of the Enigma Strain. That's my best-selling title, um, but you can start to see how it's not just release the ebook once and now you're done. When we talk about leverage, think in terms of what are some other ebook formats that we can release. For example, think of ter think in terms of how your readers want to consume your content. Do they want single books like what we're talking about releasing first? Or maybe you've got a, a series of books and you can release them as box sets. Um, you know, books one through three, four through six, seven through nine. I've had a lot of success with that. And then bundle all those together, books one through nine. You can do all sorts of iterations of this. Don't get crazy. Don't do books two through eight, you know, and be weird. Um, but you can do obvious box sets like this and multiple iterations of box sets. And all of a sudden, you've got one to five to ten different products now that you can sell, all with one ebook format. Now, I know that that implies you have other books to do this with, but those are also assets you've already created. That's the point. You can do special editions of eBooks. So this last one is an example of my Harvey Bennett collection. Now, it's just a box set as well, but I call it a special edition because I'm slapping on a, 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 a preview, or a, what's it called? Like a little bitty book that goes before the other books? Thank you. Yeah, a prequel. A, a prequel novella, to use the Latin term. I don't know. Uh, that would be something I'd call a special edition. You can do this. You can do a Christmas edition where you have a, you know, a, a, a prequel of your characters around a Christmas tree. And I write thrillers, so I guess they'd be shooting each other. But whatever it is, you, know, you could do a special edition box set. You can do a regular box set. All of this is still within the first category of leverage that I've identified. Do the same thing with paperback. So don't just think in terms of, well, here's a paperback, six by nine trade paperback. That's it. I'm done. What about other formats? You know, when I first got started, I didn't really know these terms, but I believed trade paperback to be, you know, six by nine. And then there was this other thing called mass market, which was tiny, like pocketbook kind of size. And those were the two like real book sizes to me. And I wanted to be real as in, you know, I wanted to appear as though I were a real author. So I, I went and found a way to print the six by nine and the five and a half by eight and a half or whatever it was. All I was doing was leveraging the same asset. You know, back then it was, in it was InDesign. I had like a whole book file and it took forever. Now we have Vellum and 
Atticus and all kinds of, we can do this really quickly now, guys. That's the point. So ask your readership if they want six by nine. Is this an appropriate size? Would you prefer smaller? You know, you might be surprised. They might say, actually, no, I'd love the smallest size you can because I do this with it. I carry, it's a little bag that I take to the beat. It's, you get weird answers, but it gives you the ideas to produce things in different formats you may not have considered before. And I'm going to say this over and over again, but all of this is powerful because you've already created the book. You've already done the hard part. Now you're finding ways to leverage that into new opportunities. Shipping options is another way to do this with print books. You can offer media mail. You can offer, you know, fancy USPS priority. Now I know that's not really a different format at all, but it is a different product in a sense. There's people who really care about supporting the post office, I guess. I don't know why they would, but uh, maybe they want to, you know, get a premium so they can track it, you know, with that UPS ground or whatever it is. The point is, don't just ignore that. That is an opportunity to offer something to your readers where you don't have to do any extra work. You just set up a tool on your website or Shopify, whatever it is, and you go for it. They might like that. They may not. Paper and cover, uh, you know, cream versus white. Why not offer both? Um, matte versus glossy. You could offer both. Now, I don't want you to hear me say you should offer every possible format ever because that gets unwieldy. And I think at some point our readers will look at it and go, there's too much choice. I'm just going to pass. That's a real thing. I can't tell you what the right answer is. You just kind of kind of figure it out. But the idea is, you know, start with what you like. I'm a creamy guy, right? Love me some cream paper. I like matte covers. But I have authors that we work with who love glossy and white. And I think they're weirdos. But you know what? We're going to print it because they like that. And then what we're going to do is offer the one that I like because I'm better. I mean, because I have preferences as well. And so you can do the same thing. Offer, you know, glossy white paper and offer one that's matte and, and call it a special edition. Who cares? The point is you're, you're making a new product here out of something you already made. I told you I was going to repeat that a lot. That's the point. Lastly, the market for paperback. Um, you can print in the U.S., and you can print internationally and ship it to them for an egregious amount of money. Or you can start investing and looking at options and opportunities that exist outside the US. Um, I know we're kind of at the point where this is more and more obvious, but when I first put this together, there weren't really options for that. Um, now we've got Book Vault. Alex is walking around here. Talk to him. He does a really good job with this. I've used a service called Cloud Printer to do this. Um, they're in, based in the Ukraine. What they do is they've partnered with like 180 different printers around the world mostly non-US. And so on my website, if you order a paperback from me that is print on demand, sometimes I fulfill from my house, but a lot of times it's print on demand, um, and you're in, say, London, they've got a printer in London who can abide by their quality restrictions or requirements, and they'll ship it locally from London, right? So that saves you and then the reader the, the shipping cost. Um, you got to think like that, though, because people will come and they'll say, hey, your book is seven dollars it's on sale that's great and then they get to the shipping part and they're gonna they're gonna bounce because it's thirty dollars to ship right so we start thinking in terms of market for the paperback for the book that we've already made and now it's something that we can leverage making sense kind of where i'm going with this don't worry it gets much more exciting audiobook oh, isn't that a pretty slide i love that slide um sorry audiobooks really are the future guys um we're, we're getting to the point where even it's becoming more mainstream. You know, there was always those audio diehard audiobook readers or listeners. Now we're getting to the point where you know Shopify acquired Find a Way, so that people are getting ex access to audiobooks more than they ever have before. Um, double down on audio. That's really my advice. Do whatever you can to get your stuff in audio. Go wide. There is no reason to be exclusive with audio. I put almost in parentheses because there's always a number. You know, uh, Tantor reached out and was like, hey, we want to do this. Here's the amount. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll be exclusive to you guys. Absolutely. There's always a number. But the point is, if it's up to you and you don't have a contract like that, there's almost no reason to be exclusive to any one provider. Don't go be exclusive to ACX, for example, because there's not really a benefit anymore. It's just not I'm, what I'm seeing. Again, this is anecdotal. What I'm seeing is people aren't making as much money that way anymore. It's too competitive, or they just don't care. I don't know what it is with ACX, but it's, there's no reason to be exclusive like there used to be. You can also offer multiple versions of your audiobook. You think in terms of how do your readers want to consume this content. Let me give you an example. I'll get wait for the pitchforks to come out. Use AI, not as a replacement for a human. We love humans, yes, yeah. We don't want to kill all humans. Um, 
but we can offer both. We can say, hey, here's a human narrated version of this book. Um, I call them premium narration on my website because I'm a marketing guy. Uh, and then I have just the normal AI version. So these are two products that I offer side by side for some of my books. Um, I give the reader the opportunity to choose which version they want. One is cheaper than the other. The AI one is cheaper than the other, right? So they can come and they say, hey, look, I just, I go to work and I just want something that sounds better than Siri reading me this book. Um, I don't care that it's AI, that's great. It's seven bucks, let's do it, okay? And then there's people that say, hey, well, I just, I love the whole production. I love the narrator really getting into the characters. I'll pay $20 for that. You have both of those readers on your mailing list right now. And if you give them the option, they'll choose one or the other. And it probably will surprise you which one they choose. Don't think that because you're only off or you're offering a, a $7 version and a $20 version, they're all going to take the $7 version. You're going to have people that choose the $20 version all day long. Some weirdos will, will do both because they love you. Um, but the point is uh, you can offer that $7 version with artificial intelligence narration because it's cheaper than having somebody, you know, do a per finished hour price, a, a real human narrator. Um, or if it is too expensive to even do the human narration, you can still do a 50-50 royalty split, right? We know what that is. You don't have to go through ACX anymore to do that. You can have any narrator that you find. You can always ask the question, can you produce this for me? I'll do a 50-50 split with you. Um, I've had people that I used on ACX back in the day who were trying to put their shingle out as a narrator, and now they've kind of gone solo. And I've said, hey, look, I know you're still doing this. Can you still do the same deal? We'll both get more money because we don't give audible 40% or you know, some ungodly amount of money for doing nothing, uh, we get to keep that. So they're, and usually they're pretty open to that. But the point is, you've got to ask the question. So you can use human narration, you can also use AI, but offer both of those versions simultaneously, and I think you'll surprise yourself with how many people appreciate having that option. Rework your content. You can use different languages. I don't know what that little thing up the top says. That's in Dutch. Um, I just thought it was, uh, it says something that is relevant to this slide, but I don't speak Dutch. Um, but I did look up what countries do thrillers sell best in, and it was like Dutch, or wh what's that country? Netherlands? Netherlands, yeah. Dutchland. Um, <laughs> Dutchica, I don't know. Um, Dutch, it said thrillers sell really well in Dutch. And so I was like, all right, cool, I'm going to hire a translator, I'm going to use some software. I ended up using DeepL, which D-E-E-P-L dot com to, to do this. It's like an app, you can get your stuff translated for basically free. It was like 20 bucks a month to do up to 10 whole books. Uh, and I went to Dutch, Dutchland, with it. And I made $14. And I don't think I've ever made more than that. It's been $14 a month since I did it. The point is, if I would have hired a human translator, I would be pissed. Because, oh, you, you, Google told me that thrillers sell really well in Dutchland. And they don't. The point is, Maybe they do, maybe they hate my books, I don't know. But the point is, you know, don't go invest a ton of money in hiring a translator, human translator, if you don't know the market. You can use AI tools, just like with audio, you can use AI tools to prove out any new market like this. Um, I am in German, but I have a publisher for that, so they handle that, that is human, all that. But again, I didn't have to pay anything because it's a publishing house. But now I've got um, the same book, The Enigma Strain, is in Italian. It's certainly in English. I've got it in French. Um, I think there's a couple others, but I, I'm using DeepL for this, and I'm testing these markets. Now, I'm not lying to anybody. I'm not saying this is really, really well translated. Go buy it. What I'm doing is at the beginning of each book, I say, hey, welcome, person in Dutchland. Thank you for buying this book. Um, I actually used a service to translate this. I hope it's good. I really wanted to get you the content. If there's something that you found that you want to fix, send me an email. Right? All of a sudden, it, it, it sort of lowers their defenses, I think. Um, again, this is anecdotal, but I think you know, people email me and they're like, hey, you actually got this word wrong or this word wrong. That's much better than them just leaving a one-star review and saying, this guy sucks. He tried to lie to me, right? So don't think that it's all or nothing. You can go and use this kind of service to, to leverage this asset, but then tell them you're doing it and give them a free book you know, for their troubles or whatever it is. Um, but I do that in, all, in the beginning of all the books. If you have the money, you can certainly hire a translator, but the point is, be thinking about these different languages, these different markets. There's a lot of people in the world that don't live here, uh, and they want your books. Your books are good. Question over here, yeah. Question was, what was the name of the service? It's called DeepL, D-E-E-P-L dot com. You download it on your computer, and you put a Word file in it, and like 15 minutes later, it gives you a Word file in a new language. 
And uh, so what I did when I was testing this out, um, it's a good question, by the way, because there's probably another service by now, but this still is the best one that I've found. Um, to test this, I went to Fiverr, and I, I found a, a pretty expensive, Fiverr, you know, level, expensive um, proofreader. Someone who spoke English and Dutch or French or whatever. Um, and I said, hey, I don't want you to, to proofread. I want you to just read this. Just let me know if this is sellable. Just let me know if this is something that people in, in this market would like. And inevitably, they'll come back with a few things, like, hey, the name of this thing got translated incorrectly. Then you just do a find and replace and fix that. Um, but for the most part, they said, yeah, this is a really good translation. You know, they, they can usually tell it's not human, or if you tell them, they'll certainly figure it out. But um, it's DeepL is good enough for me, certainly for testing. All right, let's get some fun stuff. Audio formats. This is a great way to leverage something you've already created. Most of us get that audio book, and it's cool and shiny, and we put it up for sale, and we move on. But you can take that same audio book, and you can, excuse me, you can do all sorts of fun stuff with it, like put it on YouTube for free, and let people listen to it for free. This is an entirely different market of listeners slash readers than the people you're reaching already through Audible, Amazon, Findaway, or Spotify. They don't overlap. I mean, yeah, there's going to be a few people that have seen it on both places, but people, I don't know why, get YouTube and they listen to audiobooks on it. They'll have YouTube Premium so they can shut their phone screen off and listen to it, you know, on the side next to, next to their bed when they go to sleep. Um, but the point is, I monetized a channel in a month doing this. What that means is to monetize, which means to be able to get paid by Google or YouTube for your content for your channel, you have to get 4,000 watch hours, so the collection or colla collation of 4,000 people watching an hour each, you know, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, it actually makes more sense when I didn't try to describe it. 4,000 watch hours <laughs> uh, and, uh, and 1,000 subscribers, which is no small feat, in my opinion. I mean, you're starting fresh with a channel that doesn't have anything on it. I was like, there's no way I'm going to get there. So I put the Enigma strain and then the Amazon code and then the Ice Chasm. I think it was four books, Jefferson Legacy. First four books in that series. They were AI narrated poorly at the time. I've since found a better service. Um, and I put them on YouTube. I just put them up. And I didn't put them all at the same time. I just waited, you know, once, once a week. So over the course of a month, I had four. And at the end of month two, I got monetized to the tune of about $100 a month that I never would have had otherwise for four books. So I kept going. Now I've doubled that. I'm about $200, $300 a month on a good month. But that's just income that I never would have had before. And my audiobook sales where they were before didn't go down. They, they weren't even, I, I couldn't even tell, right? The point is, the people buying my audiobooks on the normal channels are not the same people who watch and listen to audiobooks on YouTube. Now you might ask, you know, okay, what is the picture? Obviously YouTube is video. It is. You have to have a video in order to upload it to YouTube. So I go to something like storyblocks.com or Shutterstock, anything that has uh, stock video, and search for like a couple scenes of like 30 second drone clips basically is what they are. And then I just put them together and I drag and copy and paste for like eight hours. <laughs> it's just over and over again. Because no one's actually watching it. They're just, they're, they're, it's there to listen, but I have to have something to upload to YouTube. In, a, in video format. So I do that, put the MP3 or WAV file of the audio book on top of it, and then I export it out, and that's my video. Question up here, yeah? I believe, uh, the question was, in, what genres work best on YouTube? I have no idea, but I believe my genre is probably not the best selling one. Thrillers usually are popular as you know, like books, and we want them as books, and the readers want them as you know, the normal stuff that their dads used to read. That's, that's it. Um, my point is fantasy, romance, space opera, these are like newer genres to some people that they love in other formats. Is this making sense? Like, I think those are the genres that are probably going to do even better on YouTube. I, I don't have any evidence to support that. I just, I think that's true. Andrew. Yeah, good question. Qu uh, what AI service do I use to narrate books? So I um, was helping out Mati from uh, Eleven Labs before they launched. Um, we've now launched the, uh, I just say we, I'm not actually part of the company, but I did help them build it out to get it ready for what we want to do as authors, which is in their, in their service now, they have a thing called Projects, which is poorly named. It's actually just books, but
but you go to the projects tab and you can upload an entire book and have it translated right away. Before, um, I had my assistant, she would have to go in and, and put in chapter by chapter, spit out an MP3, and then I would have to splice them all together. It was like three or four MP3s per chapter, and it, was, it took a little bit of time and a little bit of money, um, but the service itself was really good. And you can clone your voice in it as well. And as of right now, it's the best one out there. Now, that may change in 10 minutes because Amazon keeps doing new stuff and all that, but I see a bunch of hands coming up. We'll get there. Don't worry. Um, yeah, so 11labs.io is the website for that. 11, the word spelled out, 11, labs.io is the website. Labs, L-A-B-S. Yep. Yeah, that is, uh, it's, it's a website. It's not uh, free, and it's not the cheapest you can find, but it's, it's really, really good. 11labs.io. Uh, I O, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to get to next. I didn't touch this in terms of marketing. I didn't do anything with it. I just put it out there and said, "I'm done. Let's see what happens." And then I woke up to a hundred dollars a month, you know, a month, a few months later. That's the power of this. If I did throw some marketing at it, if I did some Google PPC ads, that might be even better. It might be even higher. Cool. Any? It, there were some questions. I think they went hands went down when I. Yeah, great question. Am I using just AI, or did I use some of my human-narrated books? I did both. At the time I started testing this, I had some human-narrated. Um, then I was playing with uh, Well Said Labs, which isn't as good, it, but it was another version of AI narration. And so I did a little bit of both. I've taken those down and replaced them with the AI version from 11 Labs with me reading it. I think. I don't know. If you go look it up, it's probably exactly the opposite of what I just said. Uh, but I did something. But uh, yeah, I played with both. The point is, I don't think that the format matters, is, or the uh, AI versus human matters nearly as much, because they're getting it for free. You know, the reader's going to say, okay, I found this, I'm going to listen to this YouTube video. And if anyone's wondering, sorry, I didn't explain this, when you get monetized, the way you get paid is two ways. People will watch your video, and there'll be ads in the video. And if you have an eight-hour video, there's a lot of ads. You know, and so if, certainly get paid every time the ad shows if they click it. And then if they pay for YouTube premium to not have ads, you get a small portion of that when they listen to your, your, your video. Yeah, you can, uh, so you can segment it, is what she said, and, and you can certainly play with it. I'm too lazy to do all that, but that's absolutely, I just wanted to test it as kind of a proof of concept. That would be the next thing I would do, is make this a better experience for the reader, or for the listener, by segmenting it into chapters. Uh, I know there's other questions. I'm going to move on real quick, because we have one more slide after this. Um, podcasts you see up here, this is literally just taking one chapter at a time of that audiobook and releasing it as a weekly podcast. Uh, put an intro at the beginning and end that drive people to your actual audiobook sales page. Um, I did a cool one. This was a podcast I launched called Adventure Explosion. It's defunct now. Um, but the idea was I'm going to have thriller audiobooks just on repeat, you know, for years. Just mine and then another one of mine and then someone else's. And every intro, and, and I think I did a mid-roll ad as well, but every single ad basically said, hey, if you, you know, um, what did I say? If you love the journey but want to get to the destination, you can listen to this whole thing right now. Go here. And then they would go and buy it, you know, and I'd make some money. Um, I, I tested this a little bit, not too much. I didn't give it a fair chance, so I didn't make much money doing it, but I did make some, and it's something that is absolutely easy to set up. You've already got those separate chapters as individual files. Go set up a podcast and let that once a week. And just let the discoverability engine of whatever podcast service you know, uh, out, that's out there in the world, that RSS feed, people will find it. They'll just come, what is this? Oh, I'm in the middle of a book here. Oh, oh there's an ad. Okay, I'm going to go buy the book. That's kind of how the, the process works, right? And then lastly, uh, this is really good for, for nonfiction, but it certainly can work in fiction. I don't do it because I'm not a TikTok guy, and I don't want to be. Uh, but this is where your TikTok people succeed, especially for fiction authors. Take video shorts. You can do a video of yourself talking about the process of writing a book, for example or I do behind the book episodes on YouTube. And then you can just chop those up and use them as reels, use them as TikTok videos and whatever platform you want. Um, I do believe as authors, there's three methods of marketing we should always be doing. And you've probably heard me say it before. It's email marketing, 
social media and advertising. And the social media one, that's what this is. This is how you could do social media. Just record yourself talking about your book as long as you want it to be and then chop it up using a service like Descript or something and then you've got video shorts for the month. Easy, easy way to get into the social media game and I think we should all be doing something in social media because it's important. All right, moving quickly, but specialized formats, um, large print editions, signed hardcovers, premium leather bound. Michael's here, he does, uh, I think he's here, he does Kickstarters where they're all like handmade leather bound, gold foil ribbons, all that, illustrations. These are special editions. Um, I published The Enigma Strain 10 years ago, and I'm working on a 10-year special anniversary edition where I used Midjourney to help me. I didn't just let them do it, but Midjourney and I are collaborating on um, like hand-drawn, sketch-looking images throughout the book. Just a cool little thing to do, and I'll put it in hardbound, and I'll try to sell it on my website, and you know, it's, it's free work, free money, basically. Um, so special editions, people want your books in specialized formats, and they will pay you for them. Don't cut yourself short, guys. Like, don't think, okay, well, yeah, I gotta price this signed hardcover pretty low so people buy it. No, no, no. If they want a signed hardcover, they will pay $50 for it. I'm not saying you should just price them all at 50 bucks, but the point is, don't think you have to price these special editions like you price your eBooks. You gotta be competitive. No, no, no. If your reader has found this, they're at the point where they're like, hey, I want something special from you. I want a signed version of this, and I'll, I'll pay. I'll pay for that all day long. Okay, five minutes left. We talked about a lot of stuff. I know there's a lot of questions about individual services. I ask this, if you have a question about something technical or a service, catch me in the hall. If you have a question about like just generally leveraging stuff or if I wasn't clear about something, um, microphones in the back, feel free to walk up there. I know there's probably Facebook comments as well. Um, none yet, great, no one's watching. Um, <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, I'm a professional, this happens all the time. Um, yeah, question right here. Can you go to the microphone? Do you mind? Because then we can get it recorded. And this is uh, not so much a question as a suggestion. Okay. Um, when I've done um, audiobook bundles, so where I've taken the audio for three different books in the series, I've recorded in my own voice little interstitial moments, like, thanks for reading this book, here's the next one that makes a more of a personal connection with the reader, but also, I you know, at that, the end yeah. you can say, okay, you've now finished book three, you know, here's book four, go get it. I love that, thank you, that's good. Hi, I have a question about when you, when you got your different uh, translations, how did you, like, make that known to your, to your reader group? Did you have, like, um, on Amazon, did it just list different translations on your page? So that's a great question. I didn't market those, because I don't have a readership that's in Dutch land in the Netherlands, right? So what I did was I went wide through draft to digital and sort of like I did with the YouTube stuff, I just like let it go and s just to see what would happen. Now when you do upload them to Amazon, for example, you can choose the home store. I think that's crucial. You gotta make sure that it's the amazon.nl for, for Dutch, right? Or amazon.de for German. Um, that's in the last page when you set the pricing. Just make sure you do that, otherwise all your translated books will end up on Amazon.com, which isn't a bad thing, but it just, it's, it's a little weird. You're basically just telling Amazon, you're giving it a clue that, hey, this is a translation and it needs to be in this store primarily. And they, ten they tend to do a pretty good job of showing people the geospecific uh, versions. Yeah. Uh, the books that you train to your own voice with you reading them, did you go back in later and just like any dub over any mistakes or that sort of thing? I did not because I'm lazy, but you should do that. <laughs> so what I, what I like to do is tell my readers, hey, this is what this is, and if you have something that you found, send me an email and I'll fix it. Um, and so I have a list of things to go back and do. Descript, uh, which is a service I mentioned before, does really well at this. They've just released a new model that does voice cloning as well. They've always done voice cloning. Uh, Joe Penn and I were, were messing with it when that first came out, um, and it worked fine. It wasn't 11 labs level, but it worked. But Descript is great because it's an audio editor that is text-based. So it'll import a video or, or an audio file, transcribe it for you really, really well. Um, you can click one button and get rid of ums and ahs and stuff. This is a service made for podcasters, essentially. Um, but if you have an overdub voice, a vocal clone, and you import like a chapter of your audiobook, 
there won't be ums and ahs, of course, but what you can do then is it'll transcribe the text, and you can click on the word and overdub it, either using your microphone or you can just have your vocal clone do it for you. And then you click export, and now you have a new file. Descript, D-E-S-C-R-I-P-T. Descript. I use that tool all the time. It's great for the social media videos, like I said. I can record a long video and then put it in there, chop it up, and do all sorts of stuff. You can add, it does captions on the videos. So just a good workflow tool for any author trying to get their social media game on. Yeah? I'm a newbie, so forgive me if I'm asking something that everybody else knows the answer to already, but when you're handling sales from your own site or handling sales of those special editions that are autographed copies, are you using a service? Like, I'm overwhelmed right now in the nonfiction world with daily getting orders and dealing with all that. So how do you handle that? Yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, I use WooCommerce, which is a WordPress plugin, and I highly recommend not doing that. Go to Shopify and set that up. Um, you're in for a world of pain if you try to go the WordPress route. Now, I was a web developer, so I'm like, I have to have control. Shopify is so much easier, and you just get a plugin and go. Uh, but the services are for eBooks, book funnel, for audiobooks, book funnel, and for paperback, either Cloud Printer or Book Vault. Or you can hand deliver them. You can hand, you can ship them to yourself in a box of books, and then you know send them out media mail. Uh, either either way. So those are the three. Did I say three? Yeah, three services you, you kind of need. Shopify will integrate with those, and so will WooCommerce. If you're on Wix, I can't help you. Uh, it feels like cover art is a big barrier, or source of expense when you're doing lots of different print and audio formats. How do you handle that? In yeah, how do you handle that without having to ask for many costly revisions of your covers? For cover art, I, you should talk to this guy up here. Andrew Dobell is one of the best cover designers in the business. Uh, I, I don't think you've designed anything for me, but it's like I have my own guy, but he's awesome. So go talk to him. He can probably do a much better job answering that question. Mm -hmm. I have a guy who does all my covers, and I also um, I'm, I use like Adobe Generative Fill. So with Photoshop, you can actually have, if you have like a cover, with a background image, you can use something like Generative Fill to expand it. There's things like that you can do, but there's pre-made book cover websites. Um, I actually run one for Draft to Digital called selfpubbookcovers.com. Don't go there. It's too old and outdated. I'm rebuilding it right now. Um, but we are done, so I can catch your question in the back if that's okay. Yeah. Is that fair? That sounds good. Yours. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you outside. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks, guys.